Welcome to the American Institute of Healthcare Professionals videogram on anxiety. And this video is going to be utilized for SM500 or any other of the stress courses that you might be looking into. And it's going to cover in depth a little bit more about the phenomenon known as anxiety. Uh, this video was prepared by Dr. Dominic Flary, and uh, my name is Mark Moran, covering in and presenting the video on behalf of Dr. Flary. And what we want to look at, especially if we're looking at anxiety itself, is how anxiety is an overreaction to stress. Stress itself is not something that is bad or to be looked down upon. It's actually a very important element in our body's ability to respond to danger, to respond to a threat. However, when there is an overexposure of stress, to a particular threat and that stress remains in our life even when that threat has diminished or is now gone then anxiety is the result of such a thing anxiety is a reaction to maybe a previous stressor that is no longer present so we still feel the issues within us but the external threat is no longer to be found or seen. And in many ways, sometimes anxieties can be a result of things that are no longer existent at all, but totally within our mind or things that are completely and totally exaggerated. And this is why we have what we refer to as a general anxiety disorder, which is closely associated with panic attacks, Socially, uh, also very closely associated with phobias. The phobias can be specific or they can be social in their nature, meaning when one is in a public place. Some of them can deal with a thing that we call agoraphobia. And agoraphobia is just a general unsettled feeling in any type of public area, thinking something bad might occur that might induce stress or panic. OCD individuals, PTSD individuals may also experience anxiety, hypochondriacs, those who suffer from dysphoria or just general discontent, and also those who suffer uh, from insomnia usually have anxiety at some level in the background. So anxiety, again, is fear that is out of control and worry without end. It is a result of maybe a stressor a long time ago that is no longer present. And it is a complete overreaction to what is occurring in itself. So panic attacks can cause Im Im immense distress due to anxiety. And individuals can suffer from hyperventilation, chills, hot flashes, accelerated heart rate, chest pain, dizziness, trembling, or nausea. So these are all symptoms that occur from anxiety itself. And in doing so, anxiety can alter relationships and make someone a prisoner to their own mind. And this is where worrying, healthy worrying versus unhealthy worrying comes into play. Because those who suffer from anxiety suffer with a very unhealthy worrying, a worrying that is on things that are not within one's control, a worry of maybe things that aren't really threats, or a worry about something that was a threat that is no longer a threat. The stress reaction is in overdrive. It is staying well beyond the desirable time limit itself. So to worry is sometimes a good thing. Just like it is sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, good to have stress at certain moments for our own preservation. So it's important to understand when it is good to worry and when it is bad to worry. So certain things that are more present and need to be dealt with require worrying that lead to conclusions that have uh, responses. But worrying that goes into overdrive in the middle of the night 
or worrying that causes immense uh, physical symptoms of nausea or stomach pains or accelerated heart rates or panic attacks. These types of worrying is very unhealthy for our overall sanity and physical health itself because the worrying is counterproductive. The issue cannot either be resolved or maybe is non-existent in itself or might never occur. And that's what a lot of professionals speak about. Most people worry about things that will never ever happen in itself. Part of worrying and part of anxiety is also due to phobias. And we mentioned on the first uh, slide about how phobias can be acute or social. So you know, when we look at a lot of phobias with individuals and what a phobia is, is actually a fear of something that is irrational, something that is not an immediate threat. So many individuals have fears of heights, closed spaces, snakes or spiders, and almost everyone has a type of these phobias. And these phobias sometimes can be at a lower level or an extreme high level. And it all depends on how crippling the phobia is to your daily functioning, what it prevents you from accomplishing. And sometimes these phobias are a result of a traumatic experience that one had maybe even in their early childhood itself. Now, other individuals can have anxiety and fears due to social settings, fear of crowds, agoraphobia as well as being in public places and fearing something is going to occur. So many individuals have social phobias which prevent them from being out in public. So when these individuals go out and are around other people, extreme anxiety come in. And those who are classical introverts might experience this type of anxiety and just being in a simple conversation with another human being they do not know. Maybe they're uncomfortable in the position and the anxiety uh, spikes very highly within themselves. So why are some individuals so anxious? Besides the fact that uh, things have gone wrong in their life, maybe? Well, some are genetically predisposed. Others have usually, and this is, I would think, the most relevant, would be uh, a trauma that occurred. Individuals with PTSD suffer greatly from anxiety itself. And then other individuals inherit phobias in their early childhood. Maybe they fell Maybe uh, uh, they were terrified by a snake. Maybe someone chased them with a little garter snake or something to that effect. So within the childhood of an individual, many stresses and traumas can occur that may be greater or smaller, but leave an imprint to create this anxiety. Uh, also drugs, and finally listed is an overreactive amygdala. And this is uh, plays a big role because it deals primarily with our stress response. The amygdala responds to danger. Unlike the cortex, which is more intellectual, uh, the amygdala is very emotional and it responds to maybe things that the emotional side of us this, uh, determines to be dangerous. Maybe not so much what our intellect is. So when the amygdala responds to things that is interpreted emotionally, then it can become overreactive to things that aren't life or death threatening. And within that, we can have a stress response. Some, though, have an overreactive amygdala. The neural transmitters uh, are imbalanced. They're not functioning well. And there is an X uh, lower amount of serotonin within the brain. So all of these issues correlate with worry, anxiety, and panic itself. So in the stress response, when the brain interprets a particular threat, the pituitary gland responds to the situation. It is the master gland that controls all the others. So the adrenal glands secrete and this is located above the kidney, secrete adrenal and cortisol to help the body respond 
to an emergency. And in doing so, the body prepares for a flight, fight or flight response. In doing so, the heart rate increases, the breathing increases, muscle tension and metabolism and blood pressure increases so that individuals can have more strength if needed, more endurance if needed. So if the individual decides to fight and stay or flee, the individual's body is prepared for this type of emergency situation. And usually this is due to a particular stressor. Unfortunately, in the modern world, many of the stressors that come across us are not what our ancestors dealt with in terms of maybe a beast or a lion or a bear chasing us. Instead, we're frustrated with a deadline or we're having an argument with a family member over a chore or the dishes not being done. And this creates the same type of fight or flight response, which is unhealthy, and it can become chronic. And as we have seen with an overactive amygdala or due to past trauma, this type of stress goes beyond acute and becomes chronic to the point where it can create non-existent stressors even, which we refer to as anxiety. So anxiety is very much a chronic thing. It wears the body down with a continual stress response. So anxiety is an overreaction to the body's first stress alarm. And it is a major health issue. It's said that 65 million Americans each year suffer from some sort of anxious episode a year. And it's also said that it is the most common mental malady, but only 25% of the population seeks help for anxiety itself. So many individuals out there are suffering from anxiety issues. Many individuals are overstressed and it's affecting not only physical health, but obviously mental health. And in our modern world, there's many individuals who reach breaking points, whether at work or at school, and we see a lot of individuals not acting sanely. Instead, they go to insane limits because of anxiety in some way. So if you'd like to learn more about stress, and stress management, please review AIHCP's stress management certification. It is online and independent study, and it leads to a four-year certification for qualified professionals who would like to learn more about stress management. Our link is below, as well as our email, which is info at AIHCP.org, and our phone number is 330-652-7776. If you are really in a situation where you feel overstressed, understand how this flight, I mean, fight or flight response works. And if you find yourself beyond just overstressed, but in a constant anxious state or suffering from some of the things that we discussed, it might be time to talk to a licensed professional to see how they can help you better manage the stress or to manage the anxiety. And you'll find that life is a much more pleasant place than it is for you right now. I'd like to thank you for listening and have a good day.